What's going on Trip Team? Willie Michael here, but you already know that. Welcome to this week's video. This week's video is probably the number one most requested video I get. Everybody wants to know how to sterilize and stop working with grains. And people also want to grow Penelia sciensis. For some reason, that seems like the most popular mushroom that everybody wants to grow. So, this week, we're going to start working with grains. And I'm going to show you guys how to do pan cayennes from the beginning all the way to the end. All right, guys. Before we jump into the video, let's talk about the supplies we're going to need to get started. First thing you're going to need is ball one quart mason jars with your lids already made. If you guys remember last week, I showed you guys how to make your lids. I showed you multiple different ways. Either way you choose, it's going to work fine. But you're going to need a lid for each jar you plan on filling up with grains. What you're going to need is you're going to need your grains. I use winter rye. This is just rye berries. Winter rye is a form of rye. And I purchased this from a local farmer. He sells them to me at a really low cost. They're all organic and he uses no fungicides or pesticides on his product. I, I can't get enough of them. I try to stock up on them whenever I can, whenever he has extra. So you guys are gonna have to purchase your rye berries. Whoever you purchase your rye berries from, you're gonna have to make sure that they don't use fungicides on them, especially fungicides. You don't want pesticides on them either because that's gonna transfer into your mushrooms in the end and that's, you don't wanna be consuming pesticides but especially fungicides because your mycelium will not grow if there's fungicides on the grains that's what fungicide does it prevents fungi from growing on the grains so you want to make sure that doesn't happen what happens is a lot of farmers or different vendors they don't realize that these grains farmers feed to their livestock and they buy it in bulk or they grow it and what they do is they spray it with fungicides so that they could store it for a long time and that fungus won't grow on it. But for mycology purposes, you need to make sure that it does not have either of them two on them. You're going to need one cup for each quart jar you plan on filling up. Gypsum is calcium sulfate. What this is going to do, it's going to provide your mushrooms with the necessary nutrients that they need to grow nice and healthy. It's also going to help prevent your rye berries from sticking together and also exploding. Gypsum, pretty much what it is, not pretty much, it is. It's what they use to make drywall out of. Now, you could powder this up yourself, but you could purchase two pounds of powdered gypsum for about five dollars um, any mushroom cultivation site Amazon eBay you could purchase this it, it's very very cheap and it will last you a long long time now here's where it gets expensive you're gonna need to purchase a pressure cooker if you don't already have one when you purchase your pressure cooker make sure of two things one that it could hold the jars that you're planning on putting in there a 22 quart pressure cooker can hold seven quart jars upright. Then, if you wanted to put a divider and lay some down, you could fit nine or ten of them in there. But I like doing them all upright. I do seven at a time. That's how I like to do it. Just my personal preference. So you want to make sure that it could fit your jars. Like I said, a 22 quart can hold seven quart jars upright. So just figure it like that. Number two, you want to make sure that it builds at least 15 PSI of pressure. Some pressure cookers only go up to 10 PSI or 5 PSI, especially them electric ones that you plug into the wall. I don't like them. I would never use one. Use the stovetop ones, the old school ones. You could purchase a cheap 22 quart pressure cooker off Amazon for $52 shipped to your house for free. I, I know because I purchased one specifically for this video. I have an all-American pressure cooker and it cost about $300. That's the Rolex of pressure cookers. If you ask any 
experienced mycologist, what type of pressure cooker he has, I bet that it's an All-American. But that's a huge investment. So if you guys want to buy the cheap one for $52 like I did for this video, then you guys will be fine. It's still going to get the job done. It builds up the 15 pounds. It's going to hold all your jars. And it's going to sterilize them just as good as the All-American brand. So you guys don't need to go crazy and buy a really expensive pressure cooker. If you want to, that's great. If you can afford it, if you have the extra money to do so, awesome. But if you don't, the cheap one works just as good as the expensive one. What you want to do is you want to take your rye berries and you want to put them in a pan or a bowl big enough to hold them. Then what you want to do is you want to wash them. You want to wash them really good with warm water. Wash them and rinse them. Wash them and rinse them. Repeat the process four to five times or until the water is pouring out clear. You don't want dust and stuff floating around. There's bugs in here. There's hay. There's horse poop. There's all different types of stuff. So you want to wash and clean these extremely well. All right, guys. So now I have my rye berries all washed off. I transferred them into a pan. This is the same pan that I used to sterilize my PF cakes, like in my other video. So once you have the rye berries inside the pan, you want to fill the water up about two inches above the rye berries. So it should be two inches above after the rye berries stop. And then you want to add one tablespoon of gypsum to the mix. Make sure. And then what you want to do is you want to get them nice and stirred up. You want to get that gypsum all in there because what's going to happen is as these rye berries rehydrate, that gypsum is going to get absorbed inside them. That way our mycelium and our mushroom has that necessary nutrients to colonize the rye berries. It's also going to help prevent the rye berries from getting stuck together and exploding like I told you guys. Now what you want to do is you want to leave your rye berries to soak and rehydrate over a 24 hour period. Some people say you only need to do it for four hours. I like leaving mine for a minimum of 18 hours. That's what I suggest. Let them sit, do it at nighttime so that you can let them sit overnight. You can come back the next day and they're ready to go. All right guys, so now my rye berries have been soaking overnight, 18 to 24 hours. We let them rehydrate with that water and that gypsum. And now I'm gonna bring them to a boil. Once they stop boiling, I'm going to allow them to boil for 10 minutes exactly. And after the 10 minutes, I'm going to shut off the stove and we'll move on to the next step. All right, guys, now we've been letting our rye berries boil for 10 minutes. So what I'm going to do is I turned on my hot water so it could preheat my pipes. Because once you dump that hot water down the sink, you don't want your pipes to burst. If they're cold and all of a sudden they get flash hit with piping hot water, they could crack and they could break open. So make sure you run your hot water while you strain off the rye berries. Alright guys, and then what you want to do, you just want to get them shaken up. You want to release all that steam that's at the bottom. Once they're fully dry, we'll come back and I'll show you guys what to do. Alright guys, so now we've been letting our rye berries strain off and drain off all that excess moisture for about 25-30 minutes. Every so often I would come by and I'd shake up my rye berries to release all that steam from the bottom. That steam that rises is going to help dry the surface moisture on your grains. So it's going to help. So make sure you guys strain them off straight from the boiling pot because that's what's going to give you a lot of steam. If you let them cool and then you go to drain them, you're not going to get the same steam. 
How to check to see if you have the perfect moisture content and all that surface moisture is gone is take a handful and they should just run off your hand like that. They should be all free and loose of one another. Another way you could check the surface moisture is you take a sheet of toilet paper. Take one sheet, take a little bit of rye berries and put them on top. Now what you want to do is you want to start counting. You want to wait 15 seconds. After the 15 seconds, dump off the rye berries and you should have no obvious wet spots on the toilet paper. You might have little indentations because the rye berries are still hot, but there's no watermarks on here, no obvious watermarks. You can't see through it like if it was wet toilet paper. Once you're 100% sure that your moisture content is perfect, you want to take your quart jars. And I like to take a quarter cup measuring cup to fill up my jars. It makes it go by a lot faster than using a spoon or using a funnel. And what you want to do is you want to fill up your quart jars about two thirds of the way, leaving a good space at the top. So how I do it is I go like this, and that's about two thirds of the way full. That's how you want to have it. You might see a little steam and condensation building up around the glass, but that's just because the rye berries are still hot. Don't worry about that. That's absolutely normal. What you don't want to see is you don't want to see water droplets dropping down the sides of your grains, dropping down the sides of the glass. But if it gets fogged up like that, that's fine. It happens every single time because we're filling up the jars while the rye berries are still hot. Now you want to continue to do that to each of your jars. You want to fill up every single jar two thirds of the way and then we'll move on to the next step. All right guys, so now we have all our jars already pre-filled. We have our lids on with the rings really, really tight. You know, you want a nice seal. Now just FYI, the pressure cooker that I'm using is by a company called Miro. It's a 22 quart pressure cooker. It builds 15 PSI. It could also do 5 and 10 PSI. I paid $52 shipped to my house and this is a pressure cooker that you guys could use. It looks like a relatively decent pressure cooker. It will get the job done. How long it will last for before the rubber gasket goes or something like that, I have no idea. This is the first time I'm using it. I usually use my All American but I want to show you guys the cheapest way to do this and there is many, many cheap options out there. I'll include the link to this same exact pressure cooker in the description so if you guys want to check it out, check it out. It has pretty good reviews. From what I've seen, it's between four and a half and five stars across all websites. So it doesn't seem like a bad pressure cooker. And now that I have it out the box and I'm looking at it, it's actually an extremely well-made pressure cooker. The only difference between this and my All-American is my All-American is a complete bolt down. You bolt it down all around and this is a twist top. You actually twist the top on to lock it. That's the only difference I really see in the two pressure cookers, but this pressure cooker should work fine. So now that we have our jars already pre-filled, the rings and lids are on there really tight. We got a good sale. Now you want to cover them over with tin foil. Make sure they're completely covered over and they're extremely tight. As you guys could see, you could see the outline of the lid. That's how tight I have them on there. You want to make sure no steam comes up underneath the tin foil and collects underneath the tin foil and drops back through your filter into your substrate. It will happen, so make sure you have an extremely tight seal on your tin foil. So now that I have all my jars filled and now they're sealed up, I have the tin foil on them. Now they're in the pressure cooker. When you use the pressure cooker, make sure you have that bottom rack in there. You do not want the bottom of your jars touching the bottom of the pressure cooker. And when you fill up the water, you want to make sure the water doesn't go past the rack. You don't want your jars sitting inside the water. After you have your jars all in there, the tin foils on them, if you have more jars, you could take the other rack that comes with it and you could lay jars down on their sides. You don't have to worry about that. 
You could lay them down on their sides. You could fit another three jars in here, which will give you a total of 10 jars total if you fill the entire pressure cooker up, which is a good amount. Like I told you, this pressure cooker is a pretty decent pressure cooker. It's just as good as the All-American that I have from what I could tell. I don't know. We'll see the end product, but I'm sure it's going to work out fine. Now, before I place my lid on my pressure cooker, take some petroleum jelly and lay down a little bead all around the ring of the pressure cooker. This is gonna help create a seal between the rubber gasket, the pressure cooker, and the lid. Just a very light seal, just go around, and that's it. You need just a tiny amount of petroleum jelly. And after you lay the, the petroleum jelly, now you wanna lock your lid into place. As you guys can see, it's a twist lid, so you wanna make sure it locks completely on and then what you want to do is you want to turn your stove on high we'll come back to the next step all right guys so after you have your jars inside the pressure cooker you want to let the pressure build up to 15 psi once it reaches 15 psi you want to let it pressure cook for 90 minutes at 15 psi make sure you don't remove them before the 90 minutes you don't turn down the heat and let the pressure drop. Make sure they pressure cook at a steady 15 PSI for 90 minutes. After that, shut off your stove, let the pressure work its way down, and let the jars cool to room temperature. This is gonna take between 12 and 24 hours. It really depends. But we don't wanna move on to inoculation until the grains are completely cooled. All right, guys, so now our jars and our grains have been cooling to room temperature for about 12 to 24 hours. We let them cool inside the pressure cooker. I pulled them out and now we're gonna inoculate them. But before we inoculate them, what you wanna do is you wanna take your jars and you wanna turn them top over bottom, just like that. And make sure all the grains break loose. Do that to every single one of your jars. They should just fall, all the grains should just fall apart with a little movement you shouldn't have to bang them or shake them too hard because you worked to get that moisture content perfect so this should just be a breeze right here you shouldn't have to shake too hard do that to every single jar and then we'll come back and we'll inoculate the jars all right guys so now we turned all our jars top over bottom all them grains are nice and free light and fluffy that's exactly how we want it. So now what you're gonna do is you're gonna remove all your tin foil and you're gonna throw it all out. We are not keeping any of this tin foil. Make sure you throw out every single piece of tin foil. This is not going back on the jars. All right, so now all of our tin foils removed. Our jars are all good. One thing I want you guys to do before you start inoculating the jars, I want you to label and date the ones that you are gonna inoculate. I'm gonna be using two different kinds of spores because I'm gonna use these grains for two different types of mushrooms. One of them's gonna be Penelia sciensis Jamaica, and the other one's gonna be Psilocybe cubensis Fiji. Because later on in the next couple weeks, I'm gonna show you guys how to do a monotub with psilocybe cubensis and i'm actually going to use the fiji to do that but i'm going to actually use three of these jars for penelia sciences jamaica and i'm going to show you guys how to do that from right here all the way to the end so i just want to make sure you guys if you are using different spores make sure you label and you date the date you inoculated them so now as you can see we have the dates all set we have them nice and labeled. I have Pan Jam, abbreviation for Penelia Sciences Jamaica. And I also have 11.9, which is the date that I'm inoculating them. Now, I actually have a spore syringe here. These spores are over one year old. A lot of people message me asking how long do spores stay good for? It really depends on the conditions. 
there's a lot of stuff going out there that Penelia Sciences spores go bad before psilocybe, cubenza spores. At the end of the day, it all comes down to the condition that they were kept in because if you keep them in hot, warm temperatures exposed to light, they're going to go bad. They're going to die off a lot faster than if they were in cool, dark places. That's just how it is. That's how it is with brand new spores. Some spores kept in the wrong conditions only have a shelf life of three months if they're kept in horrible conditions. But I've used spore syringes that I made a year, a year and a half in advance, and then I realized, oh, I have these sitting around, and I use them just to get rid of them. And no problem, just as good as the first day the syringe was made. So I'm gonna show you guys with this pan jam syringe that I made over a year ago, honestly, and I'm gonna inoculate these three jars. I'm gonna be putting on my sterile syringe tip. There we go. And before I flame sterilize, I like to shake up the spore syringe because as you guys can see, there's that clump of spores right there. I like to get it all broken up and shaken up. All right, guys, so now that we have our spores all broken up, you wanna make sure you put on your gloves, use some hand sanitizer, and you wanna get in between your fingers and get the entire glove nice and sanitized. Just, it evaporates extremely fast, so don't worry if it feels oversaturated. Don't worry, it's gonna dry off really, really quick. So let's wait one second for our gloves to completely dry off. All right, guys, so now that we have our gloves on and our hands are all clean, you wanna take some rubbing alcohol and you wanna wipe down the syringe. Make sure you get under the, all them little grooves you want to make sure that you get any dust that might have collected on them or anything funky that might be there. Just This is just a precautionary thing. Some people don't even do this, but I like to do it just to make sure I'm not bringing anything close to my inoculation holes. And then what you want to do is you want to take either your clean burning sterilizing lamp or a lighter and you want to flame sterilize the tip. There we go, nice and red. And then what you wanna do is you wanna set that down. Now we're gonna get our self-healing injection ports nice and clean, ready to inoculate. So what you wanna do is you wanna put some rubbing alcohol and you just wanna rub really the entire top of the lid, but especially the self-healing injection port. All right guys, so now that our lids all clean, we wipe down the self-healing injection port with rubbing alcohol. Now what you want to do is you want to take your flame sterilized needle or syringe and you want to push it through the self healing injection port as you guys can see. You guys see it in there? And what you want to do is you want to spray about one to two cc's of spore solution. I like to move my needle around and hit all parts of the grains. And then I take my rubbing alcohol soaked paper towel and I go like that as I pull the needle up there you go guys that's it that's how you inoculate your grains it's very very simple very very easy there's not a lot of work that goes into it a lot of people are intimidated by grains because there's a lot more steps to it or people feel that it's more for advanced mycologists or cultivators but it really isn't it's that simple any of you guys could do it I just broke it down as simply as humanly possible. Now I'm gonna put this off to the side and I'm gonna inoculate another jar. So what you wanna do, again, is you wanna flame sterilize your syringe and you wanna set that down. Now you wanna take your paper towel, grab some rubbing alcohol, and you wanna wipe down the entire lid but especially pay attention to that self healing injection port make sure you get around it really really good this is going to help from any dust or anything getting pushed into the inoculation hole when you go to inoculate all right guys so now that i got that all set now i'm going to show you guys from the top view you want to take it Push it straight through. 
Let's see. You guys see it? One and a half to two cc's as you go around is enough to inoculate. Then you take your paper towel with the rubber dunk on. There you go, guys. It's that simple. Very easy. Any of you guys could do this. I have 100% faith in you guys. So I'm going to continue to inoculate all these jars. And then we'll come back and we'll wrap up this part of the video. All right, guys. And that's it. That's all there is to it. So once you inoculate your jars, pretty much just put them off the same way you would do with your PF Tech if you was doing BRF cakes. You just want to put them on a shelf somewhere in a room where they could get ambient light. You know, their gas exchange isn't constricted by being in a small closed off environment. You just want them in an open area on a bookshelf, on a desk, on a table. Think of them as your TV in your living room. That's the best analogy I could use. As the sun moves around in the sky throughout the day, eventually it hits your TV here and there. But it's not direct light. That's what ambient light is. It's just occasional light here and there as the sun moves around. Think of them just as your TV in your living room. It's out there. It's just sitting there. That's how you want these jars. Keep them in a room where the temperature doesn't drop below 78 degrees. For psilocybe cubensis or psilocybe cubensi, however you want to say it, they like temperatures between 78 degrees and about 90 degrees. They'll colonize extremely well between them temperature ranges. For Penelia scientists, they tend to like warmer colonization temperatures and fruiting temperatures too, but we'll get into that later. You want to let them colonize between 80 and 90 degrees. The closer you could keep it to 90, the better, but they will colonize in the low 80s, even up into the higher 70s. But the thing is, they'll colonize at a slower rate the lower the temperature is. That's what I've noticed over the years. So try to keep them in a warmer temperature. A lot of people message me and they say, my temperature is dropping below 78 degrees. What can I do to keep the temperature up? And I always suggest buying a small, energy efficient space heater. That's what I use in my grow room. So because I, I you guys know I live in New, in New England let's just get that out the way I'm, I'm from boston so the temperatures in the winter can get really really low and it affects everything it affects the temperature in your house but especially in my grow room so what i do is i have a small space heater i pay ten dollars for it and i turn it on occasionally when the temperature starts to drop and it brings the temperature up fairly quick and then i shut it off and that's how i do it I know you guys want more from me like with the, I'm going to stop putting myself in the videos. I'm going to have a dedicated space to shoot all the videos. I'm in the process of purchasing a new house. So things are a little confusing right now, but I'm trying to make the best of it and I'm trying to still put out videos. I don't want to leave you guys until I get into my new space and I could have everything set up officially. So just bear with me. I'm going to keep putting out these videos, and then when I move, I'll have a nice new Willy Micro space. It's going to be all professionally designed. You guys are going to love it. We'll do a lot more content once I move into that space, but for right now, let's just keep it going with the tutorials, the text, and let's get you guys out there up and growing. So I don't want to tilt this too far to the side, but as you guys can see, over the Tyvek filter, I put micro pore tape. Just to show you guys, you could put micropore tape over the Tyvek filter if you wish. Just put it on after you pressure cook. What I noticed is when you put the micropore tape on before you pressure cook, it tends to make the tape peel back. So it will start to peel, it will lose its adhesiveness. So put it on after. After you inoculate, you could throw it on over the top of the Tyvek filter. Also, don't shake up your jars right away. That's a misconception. Unless you're using an agar wedge, 
grain to grain transfers or liquid culture don't shake them up if you're inoculating from a multi spore syringe you want to just spray the however many cc's into your grains and you want to let it start to colonize don't shake it up I suggest don't shaking it up at all but once it gets to 30 percent some people like to shake it up if you guys want to do that that's fine but what I've noticed is sometimes the mycelium won't bounce back from shaking it will be growing fine you'll get up to 30 percent really fast and then some people want to break it up shake it up and hope that it moves things along a lot faster and sometimes it does but sometimes the mycelium doesn't bounce back from it and it won't colonize no more I don't know it, it happens rarely but it does happen so I just want to forewarn you guys how I like to do it I got so much other stuff going on I just leave these on my shelf when they're done being colonized I use them that's exactly how I do it I don't mess with them I keep an eye on them make sure that they're not contaminated or nothing funky's going on inside and that's it occasionally just checking on them now part two to this will be out in a few weeks as they colonize so that way you guys could follow along you guys could follow me on Instagram and I'll do occasional updates show you guys the progress how it's coming along just like I'm doing with the unlimited supply for eighty dollars the trip team grow part two of that will be out next Friday so you guys have that to look forward to so if you're following along with the PF tech you guys will get part two next Friday and you guys will see how to fill and make your fruiting chamber you guys will birth your cakes dunk and roll put them to fruit I'm gonna show you how to fan and mist check your temperatures and your RH everything so you guys are finally gonna start seeing the fruits of your labor pay off all them sleepless nights of worrying if you've messed up or something's grown on your cake are finally gonna be put to rest and you guys are gonna finally start getting something from all the hard work and time that you've put into them PF cakes so just a quick this is where my PF jars are at right now so you guys could follow along and you guys could see as you can see this one's a little further behind than this one this one's are just got that little space to colonize right there and once this fully colonizes I leave them for at least minimum three days to consolidate I suggest leaving them for up to a week but you could get away with three days after full colonization so once I see this fully colonized it's completely white and mycelium all around top to bottom I'm gonna leave it for an additional three days to consolidate just to make sure that the middle of the cake is fully colonized because if you put them to colonize too quick too soon what's gonna happen is you're gonna expose it to the elements and it's not ready to fruit so it still has to finish colonizing the entire cake before it will start giving you fruits so there's really no point of fruiting your cakes too early just wait be patient mycology and cultivation of mushroom a lot of it's about patience you have to learn to be patient I know it's hard and you want to keep things moving along you're excited but sometimes you're gonna shoot yourself in the foot if you rush too fast so listen to me take my advice I wouldn't lie to you also guys I'm just move these up the way make sure you guys like I said have them labeled and dated labeled dated you want to make sure that you know what you're growing that way when you do prints and you start giving prints away to people or you start selling prints whatever you're going to do with your prints that you know what you're giving people you don't want to cause confusion amongst the community you don't want misidentified prints floating around out there because it's just bad for the community it causes a big headache and it will also put a lot of dirt on your name and reputation as a mycologist so make sure you guys label and date extremely well and be very detailed with that so until the next one guys you already know who I am be good do good live good see you on the next one